Hello everyone, my name is Yi Fong. Welcome to Watching Silent Films Podcast. Again, my name is Yi Fong, and with me is Lily, my co-host. Hello everyone, how's it going? Hello, hello, greetings. So one of the things that um, I wanted to talk about from last week was um, that I wanted to give new listeners who's uh, kind of just dialing in and just playing this randomly and say, what's this? To kind of tell them what we're about and what we're doing and uh i don't think i did that last time so we'll do it this time <laughs> and uh from this point forth as well so um watching silent films as the name suggests is just a, a couple of average person trying to figure out um silent movies just simply by watching it and then our the purpose of our podcast is kind of just to talk through the silent films what i you know what i think of it what what lily thinks of it and what kind of Things can we glean from uh, the films and just all sorts of interesting knowledge that we can uh, sort of learn through just watching it and maybe doing some research um, on the silent films if we have time. But otherwise, I think most of the times we watch the films and we're going to talk about it here on the podcast. So that's the purpose of uh, watching silent films and really some of the reasons behind the 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 watching silent film podcast is uh is to just have fun and watch these silent films and learn about them but also uh, at the same time i think i want to raise awareness of some of these uh old silent classics because um some of them well more than 80 90 percent uh somebody has said before has been lost due to, you know, uh, there's silver in these older uh, nitrate film negatives that they had to melt down, essentially, and reuse, recycle, even back in the day. And so that was a common thing they did. Nobody thought about um, DVDs, Blu-rays, streaming platforms. Nobody thought about replaying them for value. And so that was one of the reasons why uh, a lot of the silent films are lost, um, due to time, due to negligence, due to a variety of reasons. And um, so one of the missions of this podcast is to have fun watching silent films and discussing it, but also, I think, raise some awareness about how to um, best preserve films. And the best way you can preserve films is simply uh, to buy these silent films uh, when they're available. Uh, most of the times it's on DVD or Blu-ray. Sometimes they'll be available on digital but quite rarely they are, I think. Um, but so I think one way that you as a listener can make an impact is that like whatever it is that we're discussing here, uh, they are available uh, on uh, a physical medium, usually optical dr uh, disc. You can, once you purchase it, it alerts the, the people who are doing these remasters and restoration and all these different organizations and they in turn will say, oh, well, actually somebody's interested in this. And so they'll keep on preserving these silent films. So that's, that's uh, in, in short, some of the uh, reasons why um, I think I want to do this podcast is, you know, have fun watching these, discussing it, but also to raise awareness um, through sort of practical means of um, doing and, and also in time, you can probably Google around a lot for there are a bunch of Kickstarters for silent films. I don't know if you're aware of this, Lily, but um, mm. a, an average person like you or me can actually go to the Library of Congress uh, because we're citizens of this great country and they have a copy of a public domain movie and uh, you can get, and that's actually what a lot of people do. They'll take that mm. and then say, okay, I'm going to like uh, add some value to this. So in the old, old days, the past, um, what they used to do was you'd have to get the actual original film negative and uh you know either you or somebody from the library of congress has to uh digitize that and then once that's done then like that whole process alone is complicated and that yeah. used to cost hundreds or uh, thousands of dollars and used to be even more than that but nowadays what they do the library of congress is oh oh you want to uh work on this silent films you know uh uh, which one do you want? You pick one and they'll actually do a film to digital hard drive scan of the movie and sometimes restore already in pristine copy. You take that wow. and you can edit it on your home computer uh, using like a video editing software, you know, like Adobe Premiere or something like that or whatever it is. I don't know. 
final cut. There's there's a bunch of video editing that you can do at home, and you can make your own cut. <laughs> wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, it, it is. And then you know what people do is they end up uh, creating a Kickstarter. You've heard of Kickstarter by now, right? Oh yeah. So for, they can actually create new Kickstarters of these silent films where you know if you are a backer of it you can get like a copy of it usually or some bonus or some uh leaflets they'll do physical printout leaflets of uh sometimes they'll like replicate what people used to get like uh film programs because mm. film was more like theatrical and you in some uh era of the silent film you had to like dress up uh, assigned seating. It's a very large opera house. Very, you know, Art Deco type. Yeah, it was really extravagant. Yeah, people, exactly. You yeah. know, just basically how it is now, like going to the Oscars. Everyone exactly. gets all gussied up, except it was to see about. It could have been a five-minute film. <laughs> that well, that well, that came later. What we were we are watching now in the early days. Nobody did any of that. So, oh no. So what people were doing is, um, I heard on some other podcasts. I think it was uh, Nitrateville. They did a uh, Nitrateville video, a radio podcast. Uh, Mike Gebert there. He, he, one of the guests he said was, in order to truly replicate early days of watching silent films, uh, you know, you'd, you'd be, it'd be like a strip mall. Like if you go to this local mall next to like, well, now we call it like TJ Maxx or something or yeah. some liquor <laughs> store. Well, one of the, uh, the, the stores would, there would be a little like little cinema. And it's not heated in the in the in the you know the the, the height of summer summer uh, high, summer heat would still be going on as uh, people get out of work and uh, in those days remember it's the turn of the century uh, not everybody had access to baths or showers like we do now modernization mm. so you you <laughs> potentially be sitting right next to people who just came from a, a eight to ten hour day of hard labor and they're you know sweat stung and stink and or people who work in farms and whatever smell that people brought in, mm-hmm. that's how people would be watching these things right next to you. <laughs> Ugh, it's not yeah, the comfort of, imagine. you know, <laughs> these early types. These It's never, it wasn't in the beginning, like in the comfort of, you know, either a large uh, auditorium or a Art Deco theater. That came later, probably the teens and 20s. Um, that slowly sort of evolved over time. But in the early days, that's kind of uh, would be a, a common occurrence. You know, remember they were part of variety shows, right? You go to mm-hmm. these variety shows, kind of a carnival type ordeal, and then at the end they'll bring out some sort of shorts, and that would kind of be the the the, the, the cap off for the night of the, of entertainment. But moving on, um, where do we get off the trail ends? Oh, so you can basically—that's what a lot of people actually end up doing—is the they'll do a Kickstarter. And then they'll use the money to hire a musician to create either new uh, music accompaniments to it or uh, author, um, you know, a, a new score for it or whatever it is it, they, that they, you wish to do. And then you can send it off into like Amazon allows you to do one of these public domain with your own original work. You submit all the paperwork saying that you, you did the copyright, you, like you vetted this out and you have to sign your life away or whatever. But after all it's done, you can actually... Uh, put it on Amazon and you and uh, a regular uh, as a consumer put this out and then another consumer can just purchase a copy of this where they'll they'll go to this manufacturing plant and they'll uh, create this uh, DVDR or Blu-ray media on the fly for customers. It's kind wow. of interesting. So like yes, it, I would never imagine it would. You know, you could even do something like that. Yeah, well, well, it's also because of just the the way the our technology has evolved over the years. And the way that our mass production has changed, like in the past, you needed a certain volume. Like if you want to replicate a DVD or Blu-ray, you're like, oh, well, how many uh, million copies of this are you selling? <laughs> yeah. So that's no longer the case because uh, nobody's doing that. And so as a result, some of these plants are like, oh, well, we're so starved for business. Why don't we do small, small hits? You know, I'll give you 5,000 copies for X amount of cost. And, you know, uh, all these what we call amateurs, but actually pretty good. Some of them are pretty professional. They'll uh, get a quote for it and say on the Kickstarter, here's the cost to, to, to do this. And then once the, kick, the Kickstarter funds kicked in, and guess what? They'll go to the plant and replicate that number of copy for whoever. 
But anyways, that's one of the ways you, as a listener, can also help. Is if you Google around for silent film kickstarters. Between that, between uh, purchasing it, showing this interest, and sometimes there are these uh, festivals too, where they'll show these uh, this the silent uh, classics. In fact, of uh, restore prints. That's actually when they typically debut these these prints at, as at these festivals. And more often than not, some of these film prints will be available at those festivals that aren't available anywhere. Again, due to these copyright issues, you can only see them in the festivals. Um, in California, uh, San Francisco Silent Film Festival is one of the most popular ones out there because uh, it started a. I don't remember details, but maybe a decade ago. I, you probably Google around for what the history of it is, but it's one of the best out there, and there's a bunch out there. But certainly, I, I think, I don't remember the name now. I got to look this up later. But there's also one in, like, Italy that's been around for, like, decades. It is one of the premier ones where if they do restore a silent film, it'll most likely, a popular one, it'll, like, debut there. So, anyways, so these are some of the m- venues that I foresee our listeners um, sort of partake in and know about uh, and things that they may or may not know that as they're kind of, oh, what's this? Uh, watching silent films. Uh, we'll, we'll, try to, we'll try to discuss, we'll try to let people know about that information so that they can participate, I think, um, as a, not just a listener, but an, in time, hopefully, they'll help sort of preserve a little bit of film history um, because... It. I mean, in my mind, if you don't really know history, I think you you would just be. It would be hard for humanity to move forward, just because you don't know what it what has occurred. You know, like if we're so ignorant of history, we're doomed to repeat it again. I'm sure, there's an old adage of that version of what I just said. <laughs> yeah, but I'm actually really curious about the San Francisco Silent Film Festival. Has that already happened this year, or can we still go see it? For people who are interested right now, um, I'm I can Google it right now. But San Francisco Silent, it happens I think every year, and so I, it's uh, SilentFilm.org. So I think they're into 2020 now. So it's uh, 25th anniversary, April 29th. So that's that's oh. the next one. Anyway, so yeah, so it's uh, pretty cool. Uh, stuff um but anyways what was i my thought process was that this is kind of the purpose of our podcast little podcast here in this corner of the uh the internet <laughs> that mm. my desire is that you know have fun and watch movies and, and talk about it but also just raise awareness and uh, bring people in in the know of you know where you can experience these classic films but also where you can sort of help preserve them you know for just uh history's sake so that's kind of the mission i guess if there was such a thing for this podcast i would have to agree because i'm learning a lot (laughs) (laughs) so i think the the first thing that we want to kind of backtrack a little bit before we get into the last so as a result of that now last week we were actually watching silent films and discussing it uh, as we've just talked about that that that's been our mission and we were using a link of um so you know i myself i listen to nitrate uh ville uh radio podcast a lot but i'm also on the forum a lot and i asked this question um a while ago saying hey uh, what are these great works between a trip to the moon or a great train robbery as, as we'll get to in this podcast later between that film and a birth of the nation because for for a lot of like the the sort of surfacey film history books they'll often just say they'll give a few paragraphs maybe a chapter to say oh well the first movies were you know trip to the moon uh, uh great train robbery and then they go to a birth of the nation and they'll maybe randomly mention a few shorts here and there in between. Yeah, they'll gloss them all over and just be well, like, be- oh, you know, nothing happened. Well, it's just, it's it's a thick book, so they have to get to sort of the latter era. They, they tend mm-hmm. not to focus on the early films. And so um, one of the forum users posted a, a project he had done a while ago called 10 Years, 10 Films. And, the per- and this is on uh, Zep 
zepfanman.com. That's Z-E-P and then fanman.com. And uh, he did a, uh, I guess it's kind of like a blog or something reference point of 10 years, 10 films. In other words, there's three parts. Part one would be from 1888 through 1897. The second part would be, uh, what was it, 1898? 1898 through 1907. Yep. And the third one was 1908 to 1917. And between all three, three parts, there would be uh, each year of those 10 years would be a film that he selected that has some historic significance or importance. And so he did a project like that. And I thought for our first podcast for the dawn of cinema that we would just focus on part two. And that's exactly what we did last week. We kind of comb through uh, maybe eight of those movies, right? The last I, th- I think like so. I think it was yeah. eight. And then, so the, for the last couple of movies, it was the, the, Trip to the Moon and Great Train. We kind of delayed that, and, and uh, we made it this one instead. So that's that's what we were doing last week, and now we're going to kind of dive in the last two of the the early era here. And so that's kind of um, that's our that's our next steps and what we're trying to do. But before we even get there, um, I have a question. So Lily, what at, w- when we talked before, you said you had seen some silent films before like what 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 has been your previous life experience with silent films prior to like this um i no i was aware of a trip to the moon i couldn't say when i originally learned about it or watched it but my mom always had on turner classic movies on television And because she really liked watching them, I would occasionally watch movies with her because they're from all eras, the silent film up until now, essentially. But, you know, Turner Classics, they want to show the classics from, you know, the 30s, the 40s, 50s. So oftentimes they would have some silent films on later in the evening, like very late, probably after 10 o'clock at night. And... You know, depending on the teenager's lifestyle, they're <laughs> they're awake until midnight or 2 a.m. And, you know, if you want to watch something different on TV, that is definitely a different kind of exposure. Um, I can't say I remember any specifically, but, you know, you watch them on television with the music they happen to have correlating with it. And, you know, it's just different. It's weird to see something on TV nowadays, especially for our generation of the millennials and, you know, expect to hear sound or something. And then it's just, it's just music. And then you just, you know, you read the cue cards eventually, but you really have to pay attention to what's going on. So you can understand the context, as you said before. Uh, So I think that was really my first experience with silent film. And I, well, when I was doing my research as well, I remember seeing just clips through TCM2 of, uh, uh, what was it? Of, sorry, safety. I remember it was, I learned it was called Safety Last. Yes. Because the famous one is, uh, I don't have his name off the top of my head because I forgot, but he's falling off the clock tower. Yeah, and that's, that's the Harold you know, Lloyd. Yeah, thank safety you. Safety Last, yeah. Uh, I, it was great because I was doing the research and you know, just learning how they made that shot. And th- to me, that's probably one of my most well-known scenes. I had never seen the film before itself, but I had seen him falling from the, the arms of the clock. So you're like, all you can expect is, oh, what's going to happen? Yep. It is on our list. So <laughs> we will be getting to it. Safety yeah. last. Um so hopefully TCM, that answered your question. Yeah, TCM actually does have a film festival as well. I was actually trying to look up where it is taking I place. I think it changes April. every year. Oh, it does? Okay. But yeah. I know they have the TCM crews, uh, Robert Osborne, yeah. the massive film. Uh, he was, uh, I don't know. Uh, He's a host. He wasn't a, a TCM Yeah, host. thank you. Yeah. He was a, the TCM host. He right. knew everything about everything. Right. And he used to be on these cruises before he passed away, right. I believe, in 2017. Yeah, but they also have a, a film festival as well. 
mm-hmm. that they hold every year. This this last one was in uh, April of uh, 2019. So I'm sure 2020 will be something around that time frame as well, somewhere around there. So anyway, that's cool. That's good to know. You, I just men- I just only asked that because you had previously mentioned that uh, you you know about the chaplain ones too. Like th- you got familiar with those. Was that also through TCM or just something oh, else? Oh yeah. Um. I I in high school I actually did a project on Charlie Chaplin. We now that I hadn't thought about that for a while, we had to do. S- I don't, can't remember exactly what the project was. I'm not 100% sure if it was a silent era actor, but it was a part of my drama class. And then we would have to kind of act out the person on stage and who they were, what they did, why they were famous. So I had researched Charlie Chaplin and I learned a lot about his life. And I, and I ended up watching a, a couple of his movies and I think that might have been the really like really the first time besides TCM where I had watched any silent films. I knew I knew of Chaplin f- from before too. Just I think just from history books, but I never really knew what his shtick was, who he was, why he did what he did. So I was really uh, I was really fortunate to get Charlie Chaplin. I could have, I mean, not saying I could have had, uh, let me, sorry, let me start that over. If I had someone more obscure, I'm sure I would have learned something amazing about them as well. But it was nice to know that this famous person actually did and accomplished a lot at the time. Yeah, he's certainly um, one of film history's greatest artists uh, to have ever lived and contributed massively to just uh, have you heard well first you know that there was a robert downey jr movie chaplin oh yeah in, in <laughs> i totally watched that <laughs> his chaplin's uh daughter i think played chaplin's mother in that movie because haroldine chaplin is also an actress you've mm-hmm. seen her in many movies yeah but she actually played her dad well in the movie as a character she played the uh, the mother of Chaplin, which is kind of funny. Or is it grandmother? One or the other. I know. I haven't seen it for a couple years, so I don't remember right now. But um, Chaplin, the, have you ever heard of the term auteurs, like the auteur theory of films? I believe I have, but feel free to tell me again. I could totally learn. It... it, it uh, High level basically means that uh, a single artist for a movie has contributed greatly to sort of what the movie has done or is about. That's essentially high level what that means. That term was coined, I think, much later by a bunch of French people, uh, film critics. Um, But Chaplin, of course, was prior to all those things, you know. And so he was doing this auteur thing even before they even coined the term for it. <laughs> so That makes sense. Imagine, if you will, uh, what an auteur is. that it, It's a person who is so highly f- influential on the film itself, so not only would, would he direct it, he would act in it, and then and he may... Like, Clint Eastwood would probably qualify as one because he'll often... Uh, not always, but he has in the past some of his movies. He's directed, written, acted... Mm-hmm. Uh, also wrote composed scores for it and uh, probably did some designs set designs or uh, costumes for it so that yeah would... a good example of that is unforgiven back in 92 because yep. i won the oscar as well yeah absolutely so it's it's commonplace now that term and kind of which artists you can attribute that to the movies that they've created but so he was doing that before the term was even coined <laughs> So I think that was one of his, I, I I don't know if he was the first or, I mean, like I said, first is really hard to, a term. Yeah, especially challenging. Then. But if not the first, then definitely one of the most powerfully, uh, massively talented person. I mean, more often than not, he would come up with the idea to for his films. He would 
uh, obviously act and starred in it, but then did clothing, set designs, everything that you can think of. He just had a direct hand in. Uh, but not only that, towards sort of the retirement phase of his life afterwards, he actually went back through all of his films and composed scores, original scores for them, all of them. And in fact, um, what like... I heard rumors they're doing some restoration, remastering, bringing some of the uh, his old films, trotting them back out. And as they're doing that, because there's some sort of anniversary coming up for him as well. And as they're doing that, the chaplain estate states that, you know, you can only show these now with his score, which makes sense because obviously mm. he composed these scores for it. But anyways, right. we'll get to those at a later time. So yeah, he was highly, highly influential massive massive artist that's for sure well i do have a question for you ifong sure um so what was the first silent film that made you feel inspired to learn more about the genre that's a great question um i don't remember if i had a first uh encounter with silent films um but what i do remember was that I'm very kind of, for the lack of a better term, OCD. My <laughs> wife's a nurse. She hates you, me using that word because I don't have it. But <laughs> it's uh, for the <laughs> lack of a better term, it's it's kind of like I, I like to sort of uh, use, I like to experience an art from the beginning and kind of work my way chronologically through the art um, until modern times, I guess. And so that's... That can be really challenging with films because there's a lot of films and I'll probably never watch all the films ever made in the history of all films. But I, I actually try to make an attempt to do that in the early uh, 2000s. So in the early 2000s, uh, Netflix wasn't doing um, like uh, streaming that you know of now. Netflix used to, uh, they still do, I think, under a different name. Yeah, I guess, the Redbox, right? No, uh, that's a different company. Um, hmm. It's like DVD.com. Like Netflix split off their DVD division from their streaming services. And they, I think, only use Netflix for their streaming, but not the, the DVD rental. Although, okay. I think it's the same company still. Or they don't sort of advertise it as much. But there there are still ways where you can like go on and order a DVD and have it mailed into your, uh, via like a red envelope. <laughs> hmm. So, anyways, that's how I started with Netflix, and I, I distinctly remember that there was levels of the service where you can be like, you can order two out at a time. You know, you'd watch one, you watch b both uh, discs, and then you return them for the next two. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I, I did like the eight out at a time, which was the maximum amount of discs I can get out at a time. And in high school, I took a really brief film history class called uh, A Short History of Movies. Or it's based on the book. The class curriculum in high school is based on the book by Bruce Cowain, which is, I think, a, a popular uh, movie critic. And he wrote a, 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 a film history book called A Short History of Movies, which is like a lot of you know, film history books like that. It's very ambitious. It's trying to cover all films, right, from all era of time. Mm. But in the back of that, there's an appendix of list of movies. So I, I always kept that book after the class. I didn't, you know, in the textbooks when you get those, you usually sell them afterwards. Yeah, the you usually give over. them back unless you really <laughs> liked it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if they still have textbooks, but that's how we used to do them back in the day. So they, uh, <laughs> so I, I kept it and I, I still have it. And then in the early 2000s, with along with the book I, and along with the Netflix subscription, I ended up. What go, going through and combing and, and borrowing all as much as I can, whatever is available on DVD, of all those artists, starting with the early cinema. So if I saw Chaplin, I would like get all of their his short movies with uh, I, I I forget he was with uh, I can't remember the names out, but there's a bunch of companies he used to work for before he uh, kind of did his own thing with you know artists. Mm. And uh, uh, and so I would get shorts, collection of shorts on DVD, and I watch his shorts. So I'd probably seen most of the shorts that was released on DVD then. Since then, I, I bet more stuff has been released. But at that time, I watched everything I could get my hands on. So I've seen like everything that Chaplin has ever done uh, at that point in time has been available to me. And uh, same thing with Buster Keaton and 
Lloyd, but certainly not not exclusive to that. It was like, you know, F.W. Myrna, Fritz Lang, and uh, it's just whoever it was then I could get my hands on, I would just comb through their entire filmography. I would just consume it. So that's what I did, and that was my exposure to it. Now, I was so astonished. Every silent film I, I saw, it just, like, blew my mind, and it expanded my horizons because it, it, it ultimately became my favorite era of film even surpassing like color movies and widescreen stuff because I just love the fact that early filmmakers were so innovative that, you know, they say that, uh, what's it called? Um, necessity is the mother of invention or something like that. I think well, so. Yeah. So they, they, they needed to succeed with this new medium of filmmaking and they did everything that they could, possibly imagine from scratch they didn't have a reference point there wasn't a you know a uh, 2001 space odyssey <laughs> when they were growing yeah. up with film there wasn't a uh you know spark as there wasn't oh i'm talking about kubrick now but there wasn't a uh you know name your favorite filmmaker whatever it is they didn't have any of those reference point they only had the things that they knew which was a lot of it was not just volville but theater and classic works of the painters, the Renaissance painters and uh, from the Romantic era and, and any era, actually, and also classical music. That's kind of the time, you know, that they came out of. And I love that they trailblazed the industry even without even knowing that they did because for them, for, to them, it's simply a job that they were doing to make money and get by as a living. So, in short... I think that sort of answers the question around about way was I can't remember the first first, but um, I certainly watched the um, trip to the moon and uh, great Tri train robbery. I don't think y we had YouTube yet back then, as I recall. So it was just on DVD still. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, or I think it was VHS. I think I got, I got the library and borrowed some VHS tapes. But anyways, um, that's how I got started. That's essentially how I got into uh, silent film in general is that I just wanted to know how it was in the beginning, how this whole industry, how film was started from the get-go. And, you know, I watched so many of it, and I'm just like, I I'm just blown away um, by how much innovation um, it's in, in, in as they're uncovering uh, silent films. Because um, sometimes, like, a silent film will be stuck in somebody's att attic, and they'll find it again. So even though... I I didn't see that movie in early 2000s. It may have come out since then. You know what I mean? Mm. So as we're kind of going through these silent films, I haven't, I wouldn't have seen all of them just because at back then it wasn't even available. And so those I'm kind of excited to, to catch up on as well. And also even older movies that I already seen, they have new prints of it. I haven't seen those either because I haven't really touched it in many, many years. So. Yeah. And absolutely. You should get into the, doing that again just so you can you know get that experience and just makes you more happy and then you learn everything yeah i mean i love it because it's just like the art they weren't even thinking about it as art they were just like this is just a job <laughs> 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 so and with these guys that the, the thing we're going to review both uh, porter and uh Milius, again it was just something that they were doing as part of their their act or their gig they weren't really uh, thinking about this as an art or anything like that. They were just they were just surviving, you know, in, in essence. Mm. So, all right. So with that, um, I think we can just get into it right away. So, you ready to tackle uh, a trip to the moon, George? Absolutely. Millions? All right. Oh yeah. So. What was your first impressions, even from the beginning? Like, if you can recall the first time you watched this, compared to even now. Um. So I watched it two ways. The first was absolutely silent, and you know it was just bore. You know, not, well, it wasn't boring. Uh, the very beginning of a trip to the moon. It, it's just all these men are chatting, and I don't really know what's going on. And eventually they're coming up with this idea, you know, to go to the moon. And you're like, okay, 
you know, blah, blah, blah. But watching it the second time and having the music as a reference point to jump from, it kind of just builds the emotion naturally. So you can kind of get a better feel of what's going on in the scene. And I was just surprised because, you know, I was a lot more invested now in this film than I had been before when there was just nothing going on. I mean, of course, I paid attention to the whole thing in general, especially when they got to the special effects with smoke or lighting tricks. But I thought this with music will definitely add depth to something that wasn't there before. Um, and as the film continued, it was it was really interesting, even in black and white. I haven't seen the colored version yet, of course. But you could tell that almost no expense was – what? Uh, yeah, there was, there was no expense. You could see the quality of all the painting on all the set pieces. It, it looked really good. I mean, you know there's a suspension of disbelief that, oh, it's not a real spacecraft. But it, it looked very good. And you, you can enjoy this movie at any age, any era. Yeah, I agree. I uh, I haven't shown it to my son yet, uh, but I think he would love it, just because um, it's like the f at least the time of this recording. It's the fiftieth anniversary of Apollo Eleven, and uh, both th the school he's been going into for education, and also just some of the things that we're learning about through our local library. Mm. They're really big on just like space, space program, how we got to the moon and back, and uh, you know. I, I've been kind of waiting till now, I think, to try to show him this. I haven't done it yet, but I will. And uh, I think he'll love it just because he knows about the real life. Uh, you know, we we want to see... Um, did did you ever catch that uh, documentary that came out recently of Apollo 11? It's just called Apollo 11. It's by CNN. No, I hadn't. I actually don't have television anymore. Oh, it's but like I a, love space myself. So it's like in the I movie would, theaters, I think, for a while. Oh, it's in the movie theaters. I, will I, have I think to it's check gone it now, then. but it's probably on DVD oh. or Blu-ray. Um, what was I saying? Oh, so I took him to see that. And what that movie was is the there's a documentarist. He went to NASA, and I think these are, again, public. It's government, right? So it's all tax paid for. Mm. And they did uncovered that the the there was a a lot of government sort of people recording this on film, but not only regular film. They filmed this using sixty five mil millimeter, and it was like in pristine high resolution. And for I guess the the listeners who don't know, it's typically the the for the longest time film has been on thirty five millimeter, even after the silent era, and so. Um, in the latter half of the century, the the 20th century, um, as film continued to evolve, um, some of the things that came up with was a larger format print. So instead of 35, it was 70, which doubled the resolution, or maybe more than doubled. But it made the film, sort of physical film, larger. And as it was larger, it was able to capture more things on the lens than you could possibly do. And so... Anyways, NASA had a bunch of footage of this the Apollo 11 event. And so this guy took all of that film negative and digitized it and showed it and like edited a movie out of that. So the wow. entire movie, there's like it's not like a regular documentary of talking heads. Usually documentaries have people that just you know, this is a historian, this, this, then, and they, they study this, and here's a PhD person, and here's gonna, he's going to tell you what's going on, you know what I mean? Like a talking mm. head. Well, this document doesn't have any of that. It just has the footage from the launch. And the audio, I'm sh like a lot of it was Foley, so there's, there's some, some artifice, which is fine, but I think a lot of the actual dialogue came from control, mission control, and... Uh, the three astronauts that went up to Apollo 11. So it was an amazing, amazing like, thing because you have to... It's one of those documentaries that you have to read into a lot of. I don't always like that, but it, it works for this movie because this was an era of time when um, America decided to just... It, it felt like there was this huge momentum culturally that we were 
together as one, not just Americans, but also as uh, as a as the world. Like as the a entire, generation too. Yeah, yeah. The, the entire world felt like it was one single entity to 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 monitor and see this progress of the man reaching the moon and back. So, like the fact that you could see this in pristine copy, because if you ever look at any of the ar- archival news footage, it's always just terrible, just quality. Nobody could tell mm. what was going on between the launch, the the, the 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 rocket, and all the stuff around it, and also the moon and back. But this is just super pristine. Wait, why I went on topic on this is because this is kind of big right now in his life, and to 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 show him something, you know. 40, 50, 60 years prior to that, that somebody else uh, or maybe people before that had this dream of reaching the moon in a trip to the moon would be uh, would be kind of fun, I think. Mm. I agree. So did you uh, look into uh, George Milley and what he was about and all that stuff, his life? I did a little bit. Um, I read that he... I Well, I knew... Uh, actually, on a side note, going off of that too, uh, there's a great film that Scorsese did about George Millay. It's called Hugo. I yep. think it came out in 2000. Yeah. yeah, it's it's excellent. It talk it's you know it starts with this little boy who eventually finds out who this mystery man is, and it's George Millay. And that you know the world says he died, and and. Just in this version, he was actually still being successful. He kind of ran away from the industry. And from what I learned about George Millay in the end, he actually, uh, he, what is it said? The commercial growth of the industry forced him out in 1913, and he ended up dying in poverty. And I thought that was awful (laughs) i couldn't believe such a successful man who made over 400 films and was so well known for his magicianship and his theater skills he would just be you know he he faded out and you know just disappeared i couldn't get over that idea yeah unfortunately that's a common thread for a lot of the founding fathers or mothers of early cinema and we'll see that in a similar fashion play on uh, Alice Nguyen Boucher's story as well and both of them actually both George May and uh, Alice Nguyen shared in this uh, Lumiere brother cinema like they Lumiere brothers were remember one of the technicians engineers who uh, solved the problem of still photography and making it to a motion picture right from Mm -hmm. from last week's uh podcast so they demonstrated this in uh in paris in 1895 uh after christmas and uh alex Boucher was there uh and also george milio was there and after that is when milio was like oh this is interesting and then they started to he he, he actually was trying to borrow um lumiere's machine the mirror's like oh screw you you know you can't take our stuff and he actually reverse engineered it like he bought a film projector and reverse engineered into a camera or something like some it was some some sort of maybe hazy in the history but it was it was some some sort of contraption like that he was it, again like i was saying earlier he's like all these people here are so undeterred by any barriers mm. that they love whatever this new technology was again very similar to like vr there's some, you know, uh, up and coming VR person who doesn't care about what anybody else thinks about this VR thing is and is creating potentially some sort of uh, future entertainment, some use case that uh, things of things that we never thought of could be done with it yet. And, you know, maybe they'll su- be success- successful one day. But, but right now they're just dreaming and uh, maybe the or maybe some of them will die out <laughs> like yeah. here because. What happens with uh, these type of scenarios is that the early pioneers and, and innovators, uh, they don't think about business end of things or not as much. And if they do, the larger corporations will end up sort of uh, muscling them out. And uh, oh, that's just unfortunate kind of. Yeah, that of makes this. a lot of sense because yeah. if you have the mind, you know, you have to have the 
the mind of a business person, you can't have the mind of an artist. They're too, as much as you know, you like to say, oh, I'm an artist. It's like, okay, yeah, so isn't everyone else. You have to have that basis of skills. Yeah. And you, yeah, you have to understand how to succeed in the game. Because even though, as I was reading, you know, there was so much that he did. And, you know, he was the manager and director at the Teatro Robert Houdin. I didn't look too much into that. But, you know, he did that as well. And it didn't matter in the end because he still, he couldn't keep his foot in the door. No. Despite, you know, he ex he exploited stop motion, slow motion, he dissolved, fading out, superimposition, and double exposure. Those are all famous things he did from 1899 to 1912. Right. Along with being an actor as well. That's that's not so much film skill, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean, skills. they're certainly innovators. I mean, he, he, uh, like I said, not always the first, but definitely one of the... One of the many people who who were just experimenting again with all these techniques, and uh, it, it's just interesting that uh, he kind of grew up uh, not having some of that background, but he kind of cultivated that in time. His, his uh, family was in the shoe business, like shoes family, like mm -hmm. creating shoes and all that stuff. And in time, uh, when his dad wanted to kind of pass along the shoe business to him and his brothers. Uh, he, I think, did it for a bit, but then sold it eventually and say, brothers, here's a shoe business. I'm going to move on to something else. <laughs> and <Nice>. so, <laughs> yeah, and he purchased, uh, I think, I don't know if it was, I, I think it may have been the theater or something. Houdini had already died by then, he, you know, the magician. But where Houdini worked, that theater, he may have purchased that theater, I think. Hmm. And so he, like, it's this, I guess, connection he has with that, I guess. But anyways, so he loved, he was really passionate about stage magic. H have you seen the show uh, Penny Dreadful uh, from Showtime? No, but I know what it is. So in that show, it talks about this Victorian era of, well, the show itself is about all these, you know, uh, monster shows, you know, Frankenstein, werewolves, all this various different uh, legendary monsters, the, the universal monsters and stuff like that. And kind of some of the origin stories of those. But uh, as a result of talking about that in the late 1800s, um, they had uh, in some of the show episodes, they talk about how one of the characters in there had a business of wax museum where passer buyers would pay them money. And it was an attraction for passer buyers or visitors or whoever's nearby to go into the pa wax museum and kind of experience all sorts of, you know, magic tricks or stuff like that. You know what I mean? So it's mm. not the wax museum that we think of today where we just kind of walk through the wax museum. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Like cele mm. celebrity likeness or whatever. Madame Tussauds, yeah. But the the wax thing that they did back then had a more, some of them had more macabre thing of like, you know, oh, this is the whatever Louis... Friends, king who's got beheaded and they would kind of reenact some of those and uh it, it had bits and pieces of the fantastic mcgork sort of idea of presenting this macabre to the it, it's a shock it's a shock thing like as, as, as a business and you know not much has changed right even back then they're trying yeah. to shock people and as a result it's like <gasps> see this and then like people like oh what's that and, and their curious <laughs> curiosity got the the most of them as they pay money and get in and and they're just like oh that's it well that that's what you pay money for <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's a little bit like uh if you still even today like if you go to the carnival type situation and you pay money or ticket stubs for a certain sort of you know uh yeah like world's smallest horse and then yeah, you go into the little things. trailer and then you're like what it's is still this around <laughs> it hasn't gone away and yeah. that's what people used to be because remember back then like they didn't have TV. They didn't have radio. They had, they don't have any of the entertainment that we know now today, not even movies. And so that's kind of their primary method of entertainment as such. All these quote unquote salespeople, they do try to get people into their, to, to obviously make money. And so part of the thing is to, 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 to drum up business and then get people in and then show them that whatever it is that is in there. So that's what he was kind of working in on. He bought this sort of, uh, 
theater from sort of the Houdini lineage and he performed magic. He did that. He did a bunch of stuff. And as he was doing that, um, again, like many people who were of his ilk in that time, he added uh, film. So film, it wasn't his like, uh, you know, reason to live as it were. Mm. But uh, there's a French uh, saying of, of that, but I don't, I can never know how to pronounce that. It's like something reason to live in that. But anyway, so, <laughs> so they, they, uh, all I can think is say la vie. That's not, that's not quite right. <laughs> yeah. So, so essentially uh, he got into magic for that reason. The magic part, um, so not the magic, but the filmmaking part was simply a, an extension of the magic type showmanship that he was already doing that's that's the reason he got into the magic stuff and of course if you look at his shorts beyond the uh trip to the moon and other movies like there was all these uh jump cuts for oh like this disappeared and this and all that stuff you know what i mean mm. that's the whole reason for that so um when the movie starts and if you notice the title card is pretty amazing like it took uh, probably a, a while just to create the title card, and we don't really have that type of old school design. All all the framing, all the ornamental design, the font and the aesthetics. Hmm. I think I noticed it says Star Film, uh, even though most of us in it French. It did say that, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was just very interesting. Just like the title card, like I paused there and just looked. <laughs> it's like just that alone <laughs> is something to admire at. Because, like, when you watch this um, without any context, again, you know, we talked about in the first one, without any context, it would just be really hard and a struggle to uh, to understand what he was trying to communicate with this film. And even film itself is a brand new medium. How would people even back then understand what the story is? You know what I mean? Yeah. That's one of the things I've always wondered is, like, if I, like... Uh, if you know i did a back to the future thing and and i travel back in time into that same context you know and i was a person who had never seen a movie picture before and i watched this how would i react i i don't really know because you know we are now so inundated with so much content that we can't even fathom that but if i were to go back in time and i i I'd never seen anything like that before Again, it's something like the VR thing. Like, I haven't seen a lot of VR. And I bet if I somebody showed me something impressive, it's like, oh, that's pretty amazing. I never thought about that. And I bet it would be some sort of sense like that, too. Is that, you know, I've never seen film before, and then he shows me this film. Like, wow. Like, I, I don't know if I would understand everything either. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, well, well, well so... Did you answer that? What was your first impressions between the first first time that you saw and, and this other this? Because you said you've you've seen it before, maybe on Turner or other places, and compared to now, hmm. is there a change between the first first time, if you recall, that you saw you saw this versus now? Well, I as I feel like this happens with a lot of things. You see part of it. You never, at least for me, uh, I know I had seen it before, but possibly. And I I noticed this too in just reading it online. Uh, the capsule landing on the moon is one of the most iconic and frequently referenced images in the history of cinema. So once I read that, and after you know us talking back and forth, I realized maybe I never actually did see the full film. I I know I've seen that part of the rocket getting into the moon's face, but everything outside and around that i don't think i'd seen before which is weird so um seeing it real for the first time and finally knowing what it was about was it was definitely you know not what i expected there's the way malay designed it is so much more extravagant uh, because of the theatrical skills that he had to learn especially for working on a theater stage there's all those moving parts that yep. could have been pulled up and down with the fly which is when you know they pull stuff into the the roof of the theater to get it out of the way and the same thing happened when the men were looking back at earth and then the moon 
pieces seem to shift lower. I'm so glad you noticed that because uh, you have some theater background <clears throat> and uh, yes. being in theater for a long time, you can totally recognize the theater background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it's all these set pieces. Yeah. I'm like, wow, there's so much detail. This he, would be amazing. <laughs> he did not uh, hide the fact that it was very theatrical, you know, because they didn't yeah. know anything else, right? At least in the beginning, mm -hmm. they they weren't thinking of, oh, let's not point the camera directly at the stage. They were just like, let's again. It's one of those yeah, things that fill the set and you know focus on that, so you don't see anything outside of it. So you know. The per yeah, the person's looking straight at the shot. Exactly. Yeah. So there yeah, there's a lot of theatery things that he did. The the I will say the only thing I didn't understand was that they seem to be when they right before they're gonna get shot into the cannon, they're walking on the roofs of the houses. <laughs> I don't know if that was just a, a set design idea, but I was. I don't know. I didn't understand why they would have these people walking on the houses because they wouldn't be bigger than that. Uh, yeah, certainly. I don't know. Yeah. It's, um, I think part of it is that's a show off what you can do is, is my guess. Probably. Um, because he, he probably spent like a lot of this other works. He it, there there may not necessarily be stories to it. You know. Part of it is simply mm -hmm. just uh, showing off what the, the sets are and what it could be. And like in that particular instance, if you actually zoom in, like I think there was uh, there is a lot of activity in the background of like uh, sort of some water activity. Like the set had liquid pouring through it if you paused it. <laughs> And so, I must have missed it then. Yeah, because I uh, definitely really saw steam set. rising. Yeah, and there was the tugboat. Yeah, it's and sort of I like a steampunk thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. steampunky. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering too because I uh, when the tugboat's pulling the the cannon, uh, not the cannon, the whatever it is. I wasn't sure if it was a puppet moving because it looked very jerky, like a wrist moving a sock around. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, it probably was that as well. But yeah, so that's kind of... Uh, so my impression of it is just that, you know, it, 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 it might not be the very first, but it is quite a stellar effort in the beginning. Yeah. And just looking at the title card was just amazing itself. Some of the things in the beginning, I, I had a really tough time of just even understanding because even with the title cards and the words... They often don't write everything. I don't know if they yeah, expect no. people to read the lips, but at least through their conversation, I guess through their acting, we're supposed to imply that they all, they had some disagreements, for example, and they were tossed, mm -hmm. the, one of the guy on the board was tossing papers against the other guys, and then... Yeah, I realized that the second time I was watching it too. He was throwing stuff at his his team. <laughs> like, okay... <laughs> But, you know, one thing that I really enjoy, again, is the whole set piece, because uh, we'll, when we get to the doctor of uh, doctor, uh, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, you'll notice that the German expressionism movement, the sets are like incredible. But this movie was many years before that movie and the sets here, it feels like it extends the stage. Like even if you look at like in the beginning of the the movie when they're all the astronomers or whatever they're in this building but in the background it's tremendous like it's like mm. it, it it's probably it a stage big. but it looked like it was a huge massive uh the cathedral right of, yeah they or, probably did force perspective exactly so that i was thinking about um uh that and also when they were on the rooftop looking at back of the, all the steampunk stuff i was thinking about uh, Leonardo da Vinci, when he did some mathematics on his painting, especially with the Last Supper. Um, have you heard of this uh, perspective when they're using, like he basically used math to triangulate how uh, the, the people who are closest on the tables to the front were larger compared to some of the background designs, which gets smaller and smaller in scale. 
Have you heard yes. of this? No, no. Yeah. No, yeah. So prior to him, a lot of the artists didn't use sort of math, mathematical perspective to sort of accurately portray the size. It would be very approximate. So some of the paintings would be like deformed. In other words, like sometimes mm -hmm. their feet would be larger than their head or it's, it's a, it's a very awkward uh, art, but uh, with the way that he did it, I thought, I don't know if he actually used it, but it looked like there was some sort of perspective the way that Da Vinci used uh, for all of his kind of art deco-ish design for the set pieces. And it was very German uh, expressionistic, expressionistic even by many, many years prior to it happening. So that I thought that was really interesting. Um, I just didn't understand, I guess, what the, um, the, the conversation that they must have had. Maybe they disagreed on whether to go to the moon or not, or maybe just the details on how to go to the moon or not. I, I wasn't quite sure about the fight in the beginning. Mm. And of course, there are these girls sitting there for no reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Other they're than just, just to be there. To look it's good. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, okay. So that's I mean, part of the, the movie. That's fine. <laughs> you gotta move I, on. I wasn't sure if they were the note takers or the scribes at oh, first. Yeah. But you're right. They do just sit there. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought that was interesting. But, uh, and it, it, but if you read kind of the plot lines of this uh short it explains a lot more things i guess that without uh n anybody actually reading the script or actually reading this outline nobody would know <laughs> yeah for real <laughs> which i thought was super interesting so like apparently that there's supposed to be these uh uh astronomers uh nostradamus being one of them and all these real life references to older astronomers famous ones they're the ones in the meeting halls and they're the ones who are going to go. And that's the, that's why they had some debates about them. <laughs> ah. So it's like, oh, well, you didn't write that in there. And there's no way for us to know unless somebody yeah. like wrote uh, an actual script about which apparently, you know, he may have referenced that in his own designs or whatever. But it's hard to know that unless somehow it's communicated to us. Right. So. Mm -hmm. um, but. So that was kind of the tough part of struggling through the narrative w without understanding what even the context is. But that's kind of how they were trying to do it. It was they, they, it's just more of an experiment, right? As they're yeah. going through. But later on, uh, as they move into trying to uh, launch the the rocket is or the cannon or the rocket or capsule whatever it is that they launch out i guess there is a an army of women i guess <laughs> yeah the <laughs> army to, of women <laughs> and sailors I'll, i don't know they're trying to help them get into the, the i just thought it was again very theatrical it's almost like they're gonna break out into a broadway number yeah kick line <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> so like okay that's interesting still um but yeah so that but that whole piece is pretty amazing for 1902 right the fact that the he imagined what it would like to get into this thing and shoot out of something to propel motion you know obviously he didn't know that one day we were actually going to be the moon but he yeah. logically still thought that you had to launch somehow towards the moon to get there and and so that was quite interesting and uh once they get in, they get there, they, they they get into the moon. And again, all of the background stuff is, is pretty astonishing. Like uh, it's, That's the one big thing about this is the backgrounds is just the artwork is just amazing, right? And mm. and did you like the thing about the the moon being, is that a pie or some cheese or, or some, <laughs> some sort of design? I don't know what it was. What was What uh. was that moon? I don't know. Man if in we, the moon. <laughs> yeah, the man, the man in the moon. Yeah. Some guy. Yeah. I don't know if they ever actually say who the moon is. Yeah. Because I was wondering if it might be Bal Malay himself, yeah. but I don't know. Who's probably his producer? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so apparently it's about like uh, there. There is a whole concept of the thing called the man in the moon, though. It's some sort of a. Uh, it's it's it it is uh it, there is some history behind it like in ancient history in um like the uh greek and roman uh legend 
it's supposedly some sort of like a, a, a sheep thief. Like the moon would steal your sheep <laughs> at night when you were looking. <laughs> And, and, and uh, you can look this up on the either Google Wiki or something. But the, like, if you if you look at the full moon like just as is, you know how they're like spots, crater spots, right? Yeah. And it's like a Rorschach test. People can see different shapes in it, and that's the whole concept. When I say man in the moon, I'm not talking about like a a physical man on the moon per se, but I'm thinking about the fact that people are are reading into the shapes of the moon, mm. so that it becomes it personifies some of their fears. Or something. So for like the Roman, it's like the sheep thing because, you know, somehow it's related to that. Or like uh, Dante references some of that stuff. Like, or in Chinese mythology, there's something about the moon uh, where it, it basically talks about how somebody gets, there's a character in legend mythology. There's a goddess that gets stranded on the moon after consuming some some uh, sort of potion or something like that. So there's there's a lot of stuff about the moon and sort of what is on the moon and man in the moon. So the, the man in the moon is a term, loosely uh, tied term talking about this. People can see objects or, or, or sort of personification of some th- entity in the moon. And that's what it is. That's why he had this face on there. Is It represents that, those fears or or... or what people are seeing anyways Hmm. so once the capsule is on the moon and they get out but apparently without spacesuits because they don't know any better right that's yeah (laughs) (laughs) they don't freeze they don't do anything they just go to sleep with their blankies (laughs) yeah and um and then a comet passes and a bunch of stuff happens a bunch of stars come out so i didn't really know this until i looked this up but apparently it's supposed to be the big dipper right yeah, so it's like the Big Dipper. It's a shape of a Big Dipper, and then the human faces come out of the stars. And it gets wiped again, and next we're seeing a bunch of stuff. There's three things, and I don't even know what they are, except they, like, I know they're supposed to, they're supposed to represent something. So apparently one of them represents uh, Saturn, one of them represents Phoebe, the goddess of the moon, sitting on the crescent moon. And then they, Phoebe, the uh, goddess of the moon, is the one that causes the snowfall to wake the astronomers and then they go off and discover some giant mushrooms <laughs> <laughs> so that was fun <laughs> you know you know i do disagree with most people that um film historians that say that this is a science fiction genre i would say that this is more of a fantastic fantasy genre instead of a science fiction genre because of like um like the the mushroom and all these insectoid type creatures you know what I mean? I feel like yeah. Yes, there's this moon aspect travel, but the way it's created and the way that the the film story is done to me is more like a fantasy. It really is. Rather than science fiction, and science fiction at least has some plausible science. <laughs> science fiction yeah, is supposed to be, be speculative science, mm-hmm. not. You know. It'd be probably more having to do with the moon people. Yeah. Especially, you know, being aliens. And that's to us now, that's so- more sci fi. But it would be it's very definitely fantastic. more fantastic. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's very fantasy like. So the reason I wanted to make a case for that is because I can't remember where I heard this long while ago. But isn't it interesting that, you know, now that I have children and I read like bedtime stories to them sometimes or some of the children's books, the very first genre that they explore and read is fantasy. Have you thought about that? I've never thought about that until no. I've had kids. And you know, when you read like, what's that red dog or something? Oh, Clifford. Clifford or, you know, something like that or any number of uh, children's books. It often is fantastic. Like it's things that just can't possibly be, but there's so much fantastic fantasy elements or even like those, uh, uh, those uh, fairy tales. They're all fantasy, mm. you know? So I, I mm-hmm. just thought that it's a very striking idea, the fact that as children, the first genre in children's book that they get exposed to is fantasy and not any of the other stuff, right? Not nonfiction, not any of this. It happens to be fantasy that actually will provide a way for their imagination to explode. So I find that interesting because one of the 
early um, silent f- films or early films in general, not just silent, is fantasy, which allows other filmmakers' imagination to use that as uh, a stepping stool, I think, to other greater things. Now, there's some correlation there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. But that, I- that is a really great point, though. I never really thought about that because one of my favorite books growing up was it, it, it I'm trying to think it was called I, this is cutesy home for a bunny and it's a f- kind of a fantasy story about this rabbit trying to find a home but he could talk it's not so much uh Peter Cottontail or Peter Rabbit but you know he's just talking and wandering but it is kind of a fantasy tale because you're wondering where he's going to be you get you, I don't know, you get um, not so much emotionally invested into the story. Because, you know, it's only probably about 15 pages. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, being a book about a talk- talking animals, it is kind of, you know, it's a type of fantasy, I suppose you could say. Anyways, I just find that point pretty interesting. That, uh, And, you know, later on, it itself has so many ties to other mythology, too. Like right now, we're even talking about Phoebe, you know, being the goddess of the moon sitting on there, causing that. And then they go into Mushroom Land to find these, I didn't know what they're called, but they're called selenites, some sort of... Selenites, yeah. Some sort of insectoid, and it's it's named after the Greek moon goddess, Selene. And so, apparently, the the astronomers can kill them with umbrellas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they explode into dust. <laughs> yeah, so so they're pretty uh, scary, except you can kill them off pretty easily. And uh, and they got captured somehow or surrounded, and they got taken into the palace of the king, the king of the Selenites. And of course, one of the astronomers uh, kills the king, you know, takes him off the throne and kills him. Mm. And then they escape to their capsule. Uh, you know, while battling the silly knights and all of them get in, except that, uh, so they created a contraption where the, the capsule will fall from the moon into earth, I guess is kind of the concept (laughs) because gravity still exists that way. (laughs) So, uh, at the end, one of the silly knights jumps on in the last minute. And so, they fall through space and land in the ocean on Earth. It wasn't very clear because to me, when I was watching it, it seemed like it fell into a moon ocean. Like when I was first watching it, I was like, oh, this is interesting. Water on the moon. Mm. That would be another fantastic uh, thread. But I realized it was a pretty short, short story. So, But anyway, so they f- finally turn up in, in the, on Earth in the ocean and they get rescued by uh, ships and they get towed ashore and again all those set pieces while all of this is happening is pretty incredible like you know the the theatricality of it is just so amazing i really lo- love and enjoy all those set pieces something you don't hardly see actually uh in in the times after these type of uh, movies especially it's a very uniquely um george Melia thing that you don't often see afterwards yeah, everything's so. so designed and you know so detailed. It's it just looks very clean, and you know I think about it now. It's too bad they couldn't have saved any of that. I think it's more theatrical, like the way yeah. he was doing it, rather than more just the realistic portrayals. They 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 they, they got away from these type of theatrical things along the way as it goes to the twenties and after. But in the early days, nobody thought about that at all. So he was just doing what he was used to doing. But anyways, once the, um, they got back, everybody kind of landed. And they, apparently there's a parade, right, to celebrate their return. But apparently they mm-hmm. captiv- captured this silly night. <laughs> so, yeah, that was hopped on for a ride. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know what's going to happen to that thing. But um, that creature, as it were. But at the end, I don't know if you noticed, there's, it, I kind of have to zoom in a lot, especially if you have an HD copy. There's a, 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 a commemorative statue. And the statue, there is a, a motto saying labor omnia vincit, which is, I think, a Latin phrase is work conquers all. So it's from Virgil's uh, book, one of the books that he has. Mm. The 
essence of the meaning is that anything can be achieved if proper work is applied. So if you work hard enough, you can achieve anything. <laughs> so I thought that was an interesting little side note. But all in all, my first impression is that it, it's a stellar entry and, and it's kind of a, a big capstone of all his works. Uh, he's done other works too. There's another uh, short called Masters of the King. I forgot what the name of it is, but it's in very similar vein, very fantastic. And it's also got a very, very similar story to this. Um, but he's, it's just like the way he's approaching this is, is amazing. So anyways, so I, I, I like the, the, the sort of, um, the, the artwork, the designs that he went into the set pieces and the way that he used the cuts to create sort of magic quote unquote mm. of films. The only problem I've had with this is more just the telling and communicating of some of these background information. Yeah. Unless you've done the research of figuring out what all those pieces mean. Like, y- you couldn't have figured out that Phoebe was causing the snow. Or yeah. any of this other s- sort of... S- the creatures are called selenites and all those things. It's just not possible. Not not unless you did some research of these things. But anyway... That's that's what I have to say about the the uh, trip to the moon. It is certainly influential for years to come. And my uh, thoughts about it is that it's not just science fiction, although it, it it can be. I guess you can make a case for it. But in my mind, it's more of a fantasy. Uh it's one of the start starting genres, or it could be a mixture of both sci-fi fantasy. But anyways, any other parting thoughts before we get into the Great Train Robbery? Um, I did pick up a note that he, Malay played one of the main roles, a professor Barbin Foulis. Foule, I, I thought it was, is neat that he was actually in the movie itself. But, of course, with the telling, we don't know which of the scientists he was, whether he was the one at the very beginning behind the desk throwing the things at his students or if he was one of the men who went along for the ride right it's just yeah. another part of those telling things yeah if you read the synopsis it does uh, on the wiki it does say that he's he's that character professor behind the desk i think in the astronomy club quote unquote mm. but anyways it's uh yeah it's uh again without details of the character names we wouldn't know <laughs> so right of course it's it's really hard like uh, that's what I was trying to say earlier is it's hard to gather how the art early audiences took this. Did they understand that like those w- that was Phoebe was causing like maybe mm-hmm. they did. I don't really know. It's just a very fascinating uh, thing to think about uh, on how original audiences would take or accept this as a story. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So looking back, we we, we just don't know. Just don't know. Any uh, parting thoughts about great uh, trip to the moon before? Um, I would definitely like to see more versions of it, whether it be with different music. Uh, I definitely want to check out the color version made oh, yeah. a few years ago to see just they hand tinted everything. So I'm curious to know what kind of colors they chose. Yeah, it's um, it's by Flickr Alley, uh, which is one of the, and you'll hear some of these uh, labels who puts out these this over and over again. So Criterion certainly is a big one, the the biggest, well, one of the biggest. Kino Lorber is another one, and Flickr Alley. They're based out of France, I think. So And sometimes there'll be partnerships between all these guys doing different things for licensing purposes. But um, yeah, they, they did a 2011, um, I don't know if you could call it restoration, but at least it's a presentation of it. Mm. Um colors were very big in the early days because the desire to have colors has always been there. Um, there hasn't been a year where they're like, oh, well, we're just going to present this as black and white. No. They've always wanted to have film resemble real life, which is mm-hmm. obviously color. And they couldn't have it done on motion pictures yet. It would come much later. And as a result, they had to manually, like using you know, physical labor with your hand to color in uh, frame by frame. Imagine, if you will, a factory of people doing that. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. not only a single print, 
because you can't make a photocopy of it. You had to do it every single print. So if I had 100 CDs of a single film to go out, guess what's going to happen? Every single film print, film uh, frame of 100 copies of those has to be manually colored in. That's crazy. Yep. Wow. Yep. So, yeah. So that was uh, very common in the uh, pre-teens and I I guess parts of the teens as well as they get into it. But then things change into more black and white later on um, mm. as they felt like it just it was too cumbersome, perhaps. or I don't really know why they changed later on as much, but certainly in the beginning, the color was always, the tinting was always a desire for film to resemble real life. Okay, any other thoughts about a trip to the moon before we move on? I think I'm all set with a trip to the moon. I learned a lot, and I'm glad we could talk about it more in depth. Yeah, um, The Great Train Robbery, 1903. Uh, it's essentially about a, a couple a couple of uh, robbers hijacking a train and trying to rob them of, of money and then getting their comeuppance, as it were. So, very high level. Often people will, will chalk this up as a Western. It's as quote-unquote Western as you can get, I guess. But Westerns were really popular even before films came along. Um in the in the literature so people used to read in novels if you read the western genre of the late 1800s it's a big it's a big big money maker so of course you know this is they, they're the filmmakers are simply following suit you know what mm-hmm. made it popular of the regular context of time of course they're going to make you know one of the first is um it's so funny that the first two fictional uh works and even like net kelly that we saw was very western like is yeah. genre pictures <laughs> mm, they really are so let me define the term genre pictures uh well do you know what they are if i asked you what, what they are well, I, I i for me i ju- classify genre as a type uh, you know you have your western that's a type of move you know for now it's a type of movie or you have the fantasy that's a type but that's just my definition for it personally. But I'd love to hear your version. No, that's exactly what it is. So mm. um, in even in early days, people enjoy genre films. And now, of course, you know, genre films is the, 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 the only genre of film that's making money. Superhero is a genre film, right? Oh, yeah. And guess what? It's making a huge bowl of money, right? So oh, yeah. <laughs> it's nothing but genre films these days. And, and you know how, like, at least when I was growing up, Genre films used to be like dumped on. It wasn't like a popular thing. Remember, like when superhero movies weren't hip or cool. Oh yeah, no, they were really. I was. It's so funny. And one of the local papers, I they were. I was reading about the local comic shop, and the title was just called "For the Love of Comics," and it and it talked about this exact same thing. You know, we had cartoons in the early. 80s and 90s of the superheroes but you know it's like eh. but it really didn't start getting popular until iron man came out in 2008 that really seemed to skyrocket the whole industry including robert downey jr's career at you know who would of course he's a well-known actor especially since he had played chaplin before in the i think the movie came out in 92 but you know he had gone from his highs to his lows back to his highs it was just no pun intended right i know for real (laughs) (laughs) and you know base just to start over the superhero movie launched his career back to being number one one of the top actors in the united states so if it wasn't for that specific genre he he could still be a drug addict who knows yeah but it's it's just interesting uh, that genre pictures is really the the forefront of all the box office hits these days compared to mm-hmm. you know just maybe even ten twenty years ago it was just like not something that people would uh, be taking it seriously so it it just shows you how much it has changed but then if you look at the early films it also shows you how much hasn't changed mm-hmm. because in the early films when they were making these. Some of the reasoning behind this is trying to make 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 a lot of money, and some of how they make money is like how do other uh, uh, mediums make money? So they look at literature, um, 
it's kind of predecessors of pulp fiction i call it the pulp fiction genre of the 20s and 30s which is more just again genre what people would often then even then call it kind of garbagey genre <laughs> people don't want to yeah. read or <laughs> experience but it was tremendously popular with the, the teens you know that really get into that the ki- young kids and it was that way in the 1800s and people get into these cowboys and indians and all that stuff and so just and it, that's the background for the great train robbery one of the reasons why um uh Edwin S. Porter uh, directed it. It's not the only reason, but it's 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 a mm. it's a commonly thought to be uh, one of those things. So, what uh, what was your first impression of the uh, the Great Train Robbery, nineteen oh three? So this was another one where I had never seen the full film until I watched it first, absolutely silent, and then the second time with some music cues which once again made it so much more interesting um my first impression of the great train robbery is definitely its most famous clip from the very end the main bad guy is pointing his gun at the camera directly and then he pulls the trigger and the smoke comes out so having that um from the perspective of someone nowadays you're just kind of I don't know. I'm trying to think of what that felt like the fir- very first time. It, uh, I don't know. I don't know how I feel. It's weird to explain. Because without having the full narrative, you're just kind of like, what is this guy doing? Why is he shooting at the camera? What's going on? <laughs> no, that's all very valid because it, it really explains that it's the same thing as uh, what I was talking about with it, um, the trip to the moon, which is without some context and without some knowledge of how they scripted it or how they intended this story to take place and how what the characters are and how they're defining things as a movie and as a 2019 audience looking back without any context it's it is really hard to understand what the story is about you know Mm -hmm. and i think that's one of the struggles for modern audiences to to get into these early silent films is because it's like when you watch it it's really hard to understand what the story is without a lot of more reading (laughs) and a lot of studying and a lot of figuring things out, uh, especially these early ones. Um, By the time the teens and the twenties come around, roll around as I think most of our, the rest of our uh, movies that we're going to kind of watch later on, most of them are, I think post twenties and they will become far more polished, far more defined, far more, uh, understandable uh as a medium as a genre as a as a as a motion picture and as a story uh but at at this very early times uh again i i bring i know i sound like a broken record but that whole vr experience you know sometimes people start mm-hmm. doing vr and they're like oh, what's the story here i don't know like <laughs> i feel it like been that developed yet oh. yeah and that might that might be the early audiences too when they're watching this they probably were like, "What's what's going on? I have no idea who's 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 all these characters, what they're doing, as well." So, so I got the same impressions. I mean, it's uh, it, it it's uh, it's a very fascinating story of kind of the the genre of western of just the traditional. Like now we know it's cliche in all of the architecture, right, of the story mm-hmm. and the structure, but back then it wasn't, right? It was just starting out and and. Uh, if you were a part of a small town in, um, and you were trying to make movies, uh, the most exciting parts of the town was your train depot. Like there wasn't really anything else in the town. <laughs> yeah, that had people are coming moving. and going. Yeah, while and they so, all have different stories. Yeah, and so that it it, it is uh, very common to kind of shoot action around that sort of thing. It's not the only thing by any means, but it is a very common thing that occurs so what what did you think uh the story was from start to the more detailed stuff like in the beginning who are they holding up and why did they hold the person up and all that stuff did you get into all that Hmm. uh i don't know what he his title would be uh i they hold up the man so they can hop onto the train to steal all the passengers' money and their jewels. Uh, but in the, I'm trying to 
think of what exactly they did to. They held up the train. Oh my gosh. Well, one of my favorite things is he. one of the men is fighting one of the uh, engineers and the conductors. And he just beats him up and then it turns into a dummy. <laughs> and then he beats it up again and he throws it off the train. <laughs> um. Yeah, it's like a special effect. <laughs> yeah, the really funny special effect. You can't really effect. throw real people off the train. Although some no, of the later just... films, they, they have done more stunts like that. And then people actually die um, before the the safety stuff started to Oh my god, yeah. Them. Just the stunts for this is insane. Because, you know, my one of my initial reactions watching this too is this movie so impressive because... I can't even imagine the setup of filming the train because I've done a couple student films and you need, you know, you take at least maybe if you're lucky six takes for one shot and then you have to move it, move the camera out of the pers- out of the way for the other person's perspective, maybe take 10 takes with him and you're just like, ah. so, you know, then that's just with a person. I don't even know how many times they had to reverse the train and, you know, retake the shot. If they even redid shots, because everything seems so perfect. I don't know if the Edwin S. Porter was just like, okay, guys, we have one shot at this go. <laughs> and, you know, I can't. I I had wrote down in my notes. I can't imagine the setup needed, or how many takes were necessary to film just one shot, or how many days it even took. I didn't get into that. Right. Well, at that point, he's he was uh, pretty seasoned. I mean, he started in the yeah. late uh, eighteen ninety six. Think nineteen oh five. Uh eighteen ninety six, eighteen uh, ninety eight. He was I traveling. So he was traveling through the West Indies and South America, and he was shooting sort of plates, sort of location plates and sort of uh, other th- uh, sort of the early experiments. And then he, uh, so that's some of what he did for Ed- Edison himself, Thomas Edison in the early days. Mm. And then uh, that's got, that allowed him to have experience of these things. And then later on, he started to work for um, like a wax museum. Again, the, 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 same type of situation uh, that Amelia's was. Uh, that was very common back then. Those type of, uh, like, I guess they call it uh, amusement halls, or I don't know. Yeah. There's different terms. That, that basically, it's an entertainment center. And they would have a bunch of stuff in there. And part of the exhibition was for motion pictures. And so, um, part of working at this m- sort of place, entertainment center, I guess, he would. Uh, assemble some Edison films uh, of, I think, the Smash American War or something like that. But anyway, so so he had experience doing that stuff. And eventually, he joined Edison full on again. And I think he made a couple of movies before that, before he ta- tackled uh, 1903's uh, A Trip to the Moon. So it's certainly not the first time, as it were, for him, the rodeo. <laughs> Mm. but so in doing some research in the back end again I didn't know this until I opened this can of worms and I mean I saw this most 20 years ago I guess now and it's the same feeling as I I did when I rewatched it again now without doing research which is it's so like I get the whole concept of holding people up and trying to hold up the train cause it to delay and rob people and then kind of move on like high level i understand that but like why like why was the first person there important enough to do that you know what i mean Mm. and so some of these details i kind of sometimes just obsess over and figure out and so apparently the first person is uh, a uh it is a telegraph office and so the train robbers went to the telegraph office for the railroad and said hey can you telegraph uh the trains to stop and fill the uh, train tender with water, and so that's the that's the Ooh, first thing. So he held them right. up and say, "Hey, send a message to a train to stop and get water." And so then I did more research. I was like, "What does that mean? Why does trains need water?" <laughs> yeah, because so I opened down, another can of worms. <laughs> yeah, and so this I opened another can of worms. This is how I kind of I uh, obsess over details, I guess sometimes. But it, it to me it has to make sense for this film to work, right? 
Yeah, right. So how this works is that if you look at a locomotive engine, which means it's like a steam engine, not the combustion engine that we know of where you feed it like oil and all that stuff that we know today, where basically uh, you burn sort of fossil fuel and the explosion happens. That causes the wheels to go high level. Mm. The steam locomotive, what would happen is most of the bulk of the actual steam engine, this lo locomotive itself, is actually multiple sort of uh, metal rods built into the steam engine itself, like the actual train in the front, like where the engineer is. In front of that, it's a bunch of metal rods, and uh, and it's 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 uh, built surrounded. That these rods and pipes, metal pipes are surrounded by uh, metal tanks and what happens is that um in the back of the you know what the train locomotive and the train tender is right the tender is a yeah. separate compartment apart from the locomotive itself the steam engine so what has to happen is that a steam engine uh at the engine itself has a bunch of metal pipes and it's enclosed by metal sort of tanks and they pour water inside of these uh, locomotive um, pipes and they would feed it coal like in the middle where the engineer is or some, some wood to burn. And it basically is like a, a water. You boil the water. And so inside of the, uh, the furnace, it's boiling the water, heating up the, mm. heat, the, the metal pipes. And that pipe heats up the water and the water boils. But of course, the metal tank is enclosed like you know, their only way out is through that vent at the top. And so when they pull a lever and allow the steam uh, to release, that's where you get the noise, the chugga chugga noise, but also the, the woo hoo, -hoo like that's huh. where, why the noise occurs. But reason for that, uh, sort of, um, uh, when you boil the water, the water has pressure and that pressure, um, when you pull that lever, it doesn't just release it, which gives it, uh, oxygen but it also goes down deep into where the wheels are and there's more metal rods there that will move the wheels once you pull the lever open so you have to boil the water and the what the steam engine locomotive is constantly has boiled hot uh hot water and that that you know, when you when you feed it the coal or whatever it is you're burning it heats up the metal rods it heats up the water the water is boiling which has pressure and by releasing the pressure into the metal rods where the wheels are that turns the wheels forwards or backwards that creates the motion for the locomotive to pull things that kind of makes sense yes <laughs> yeah learned so much more about a train than i thought i knew i didn't know that either until i was like oh how do, why like why does the train need water right because that makes no sense to me now that back of the tender um it's a u-shaped the like the middle part they feel they they will put the coal and, and the lumber there but it's a u-shaped thing where there's water the water surrounds the, the the coal and lumber obviously the coal and lumber can't get wet but that's why it's a u-shaped metal tank where you can fill the water in now um because these locomotives um have to get water all the time otherwise there's no water and the, without water there's no boiling water to 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 move the uh steam engine right so water mm -hmm. is an essential part of a steam locomotive so that's why every X number of miles, they've got to have a water tank to fill up the tender. And if you fill up the tender, then the tender can feed the water into the steam locomotive so it can propel the locomotive forward. And these water tanks usually are manned by firemen. And so what he was doing was the, tele the ro train, train robbers were telling the uh, railroad telegraph to say, hey, uh, send a telegraph to the firemen saying we need to refill the tender. And that's why they had to stop. At the where the water tank is to refill the tender. I don't know if you noticed that, but they they were trying to fill that mm. water. Yeah. So that's the reason for the stop there. Mm. And uh, once they get that done, um, once the water is refilled, the uh, the bandits or the the train robbers uh, get in there and they kill the messenger. They get some dynamite apparently. <laughs> They kill the yeah. firemen and they force the uh, engineer to fight with them. But then they had the engineer unmount the locomotive. I think, as I recall, without the tender, they just was uh, autonomous, you know, by itself. So once the yeah. locomotive started operating and after they robbed everyone, of course, um, 
it cuts to so that's the interesting part is of this movie is that it's got a story but up to that point but then it cuts it has multiple threads like it's got like an a story and a b story so that was pretty impressive for a 1903 movie you know what i mean mm. usually it'd be like one story uh beginning middle and end that's it but in this plot there's a and b so a is like the train robbery then b is this messenger guy that got tied up remember there was a person who came in to check in on on him yeah a little kid in a coat apparently is his daughter who is bringing him lunch <laughs> okay it's <laughs> lunch hour you know because otherwise i guess they don't have fridges we can put your meals in but anyways that's the that's the that's who that character is and uh once that happens of course then he alerts he he the the telegraph operator then goes to the nearest dance hall so in the dance hall where people are dancing uh, is where he rounds up kind of uh, a bunch of vigilante slash deputy, deputized cops or whatever. And then he goes, hey, look, you know, somebody, you know, uh, is robbing this train. So once he does that, and apparently in this dance hall, there's a, they made this person, they shoot their feet to dance, if you remember that part. Mm. Some stranger came in, they're like, dance, boy, dance. <laughs> and they shoot, yeah, that they was shoot really guns weird. in his feet. <laughs> Apparently, this person is, quote, unquote, an Eastern stranger. I don't know what that means, but that's the character's name. So, at this point, the uh, telegraph person, operator, comes in and tells him about the robbery. And, of course, the uh, vigilante posse goes, that's, that ain't right, and gets, of course, their guns. Mm. <laughs> and uh, recovers all of the stolen goods and, of course, kills all the bandits. And kind of, that's kind of the, the end of the story, which, you know, of course, ends with that shot of the person shooting at the the audience too Mm. so that's the great train robbery so just like uh, a trip to the moon my thoughts about it is uh it you know it's just so fascinating to see how they constructed this piece by piece you know what i mean yeah so I learned a lot about Edwin S. Porter, too. It was just nice trying to find more information about, you know, who he was, what, you know, why did he make this film? And, you know, I learned, of course, that, you know, he was all, like, Millier's, he was a showman and an exhibitor, uh, and he, he was bringing new technology and new ideas to this film as we also discussed uh i also read that he he was in charge of post-production as well and you know back then editing was something done by the exhibitor so him rather than the filmmaker itself and he was someone who helped develop the modern concept of continuity edits as we also saw in here um it was in the other note that i realized too that he was he was aware of the stories people wanted to see in the theater such as the genre of the western as we talked about so he besides doing all his other films he probably wanted this big one because he wanted to you know for the sake of money of course too he wants to get paid (laughs) um maybe he was thinking maybe i can create this big film for this one specific genre and you know everyone will love it and but that those were just some of my thoughts about just learning learning more about Edwin Porter yeah it's certainly uh very true i think the difference between the similarities between the two is that both of them are really into the technical aspects that's for sure yes uh, i do think that there the difference between the two is that um, Porter seems to experiment with the film narrative and the language of film much more than Milius. Milius, I think, was interested in the ma- magic showmanship. Portion. Yeah, yeah, showmanship. You know, a, a little bit like the the greatest show on earth. <laughs> Remember that movie? Yeah. <laughs> so similar kind of, I guess, feel of, of for Milius, but for Porter, he would never do the same technique twice even for like narrative storytelling. So he hmm. always try different things, whether it's changing the lighting, uh, strange close-ups, changing shots within a scene. 
and you know he 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 was one of the first ones to not make it more theatrical like later on in 1905s he did a few other movies like the seven ages or maybe like dreams of a rare bit fian there's there's a bunch of stuff he did that he was just trying to experiment with things and you know back then people didn't have actual roles like a director editor everybody was do- doing everything <laughs> there there was none of those things were established you know what i mean mhm so if you were a filmmaker you'd be like yeah i'll you know uh dig a hole for you know these characters to do for a scene or i'll move a camera here and there and the actors helped out too and nobody had this really defined line of i'm the actor and i am the dp of whatever and and i'm the production <laughs> assistant like nobody did any of that everybody just pitched in and did everything it was just a job right yeah so so yeah that's kind of his this is modus operandi for for a while he he often loved to show multiple stories um like the amb plot we just talked about and he he loved doing those type of things um in 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 his uh films and experimentations uh he did experiment in uh, 3d films Ooh. <laughs> in 1915 there's a niagara falls maybe it was like a clip or something but anyways i don't know if that footage has ever survived but anyways so you'll it, that's pretty much uh his life is kind of like a very enigmatic it's it's just not very well known um although if you look at his movies not just great train robbery but the other ones you could see that he does have a pretty interesting skill to bring about some of the film language that we know now today that he didn't really know and so he was like he was kind of just a modest person trying to experiment with this new medium but he often felt uncomfortable working with like the later on when the um, the 19 teens and 20s you started to get into the celebrity system mm. like whoever was huge star of this and that like you know Douglas Fair but he would always not be comfortable directing those guys he would always be more of a uh engineer or mechanic rather than mm. like a an artist which is interesting because he does play around with the narrative dramatic story structure quite a bit too but maybe for more of a mechanical structure but anyways that's him in a nutshell hmm. there's not much known about him <laughs> no it was very i mean his uh i also checked they had an imdb for him yeah. he had a lot of directing credits as well uh any of course all the other experimental ideas but yeah he it didn't have anything about, you know, a tragic death like Millier. He didn't die in poverty. He kind of just, he was. He, he did what he did, and we still remember him for it. There's, I don't know, there's not much to say. It is kind of a mystery at the end. Yeah, I mean, in silent films, like like many history, if, uh, if the, the artist chooses not to re- reveal too much, then there's, simply not going to be like uh, more often than not a lot of these uh major major stars would often write like an autobiographical book later on as well mm-hmm. as the biographers interview them so we know a lot about these big big stars right like the marlene mm-hmm. dietrich and, and yeah, and any a number of those yeah. guys but the um the uh some of these even though they may not seem obscure they become obscure over time because they don't they choose not to live their life out in public view because even now in in his life as they're making these movies the whole the whole film industry was becoming more popular and becoming more reputable and as the star system start to grow like more and more of that sort of popularity thing and fame and all that stuff gets into play but but if they choose not to reveal that then there's just not going to be a lot known about them you know what i mean right so. Yeah, because they want their anonymity and, you know, their privacy, just like you said. So I don't know if they're thinking about that. They just, they, they just, well, yeah, choose that's a not good point. to, they just choose not to post their stuff on like Instagram. Not that it existed back yeah. then, but like <laughs> they just, th- there was no equivalent of that back then that they could just, you know, get into the public or, as it were. But 
Yeah, send some fan mail through horse and buggy. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there, there is probably one other big work other than this one. He's done a lot of works, most of which are, are probably lost. But the biggest other one is uh, Rescued from an Eagle's Nest. is also very popular, where he directed D.W. Griffith in an acting role. <laughs> Not directing. Mm. But anyways, that's probably his pretty up there, too. Is that another one we'd be willing to check out as well? Um, maybe later on because mm. some of these are interesting, but it's one of those, like, how do you get it? <laughs> how do yeah, you watch true. it? Other than like, I don't even know if that's on YouTube. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. Let me see. Oh, it is. So mm. the, the, the thing about YouTube, like I said, is like, sometimes it just don't have that music. And like, you know, when you start watching, mm. it, it's all silent. It's like, Okay, but like, yeah, y y music does make a big difference, even if people tried like doing something with it, you know, otherwise, if it's like silent, it's it's uh, what a lot of uh, artists say. It's 50 percent of the movie, you know, <laughs> it's, it it's really the sound is of music. So Cause they even say that with film these days, too, you have sometimes depending on your shot, you have to you have to choose between your sound quality or your visuals. Right. And most of the time people opt for better sound because it, it it's, it, what am I trying to say? You will pay attention so much more with just that extra bump. Right. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Cause you could have a beautiful shot, but if you don't know what's going on, forget it. <laughs> yeah. Any other parting thoughts for this? I don't. I don't think so. I'd like. I still like to learn some more about Edwin Porter. It's just all all the things that he did. But this was a really good discussion. I learned a lot more about these gentlemen than I had before. Yeah, it's certainly. Um, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but it's like they they are experimenting at this point in, in prior to the teens and twenties. And it's just so fascinating by the time that the 1910s and twenties comes around so much more has been established already. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like it's almost done by then, which is like just mind blowing that in the early, like uh, in the first 10 years, a huge amount of techniques and everything has been totally done. <laughs> <laughs> That's just yeah, it's weird. Mind-boggling to me, but but yeah. Okay, so um, any other thoughts about uh, green green robbery or anything else we discussed previously? Um, I think just uh, if we could reiterate, we should if people want to check out more about silent film, they should check out the silentfilm dot org. Or if they're interested about seeing any of the silent film festivals, the San Francisco Silent Film Festival will be happening again next year. And to check out the one in Italy. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, we can post the link um, at our uh, the, the 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 podcast site, and uh, is now is the perfect time to give it, which is. Uh, Watching silent films plural dot wordpress dot com, and again that's watching silent films dot wordpress dot com, and on there you should find a collection of all the different uh, podcasts we've already done, and uh, also all of the related links of the different uh, shorts or works that we have been watching, and also now just uh, discussing about. So. And also, um, wherever, uh, whichever platform you are listening to this podcast from, whether it's the Apple uh, podcast platform or Stitcher, SoundCloud, or Google Podcasts, or whatever it is out there, there's so many different ways now to get podcasts. Uh, please uh, review, uh, write a review if you can, but if not, at least uh, put a rating in there so that other movie fans or silent movie fans can find us. And uh, with that, do you have any other parting thoughts, Lily? I don't think so. Other than that, I'm looking forward to what we talk about next. Yeah, I believe the next thing uh, might either be Alice uh, Guy Blachet or um, 
a birth of the nation depending on if you can actually locate these movies but anyways we, we can discuss that afterwards yeah so all right so that is all for this week's uh podcast and uh we will be going on break but I don't think the uh, listeners will know that because to them, this will be seamless. <laughs> <laughs> but we will be back in a short time later and then uh, we'll go from there. So thank you, Lily. Thank you once again. for. Uh, thank you, Fawn. It was a lot of fun. Excellent. All right. Thank you, listeners. We will talk to you later. Thank you. Bye-bye.